It is good to see everyone this morning. It is good to be here, and I made a few comments earlier in class, um, but again, I would just like to say how wonderful it is to finally get here. It has been a long time coming. I appreciate y'all's patience, and I would like to say, I'd like to say how much I appreciate the Wallace family, and I know them. I know Stephen and the children and his wife. As big as I am, I am not, I'm not going to fill the hole that they are leaving. And I'm, I know they will be missed, and we bid them. He actually, he sent me a message, and I could tell he was actually a little nervous because where he's going, the preacher has been there for, I can't remember if he said 26 or 29 years. And that it's, it is a, a nerve-wracking thing to follow someone who's been there so long and so we wish them Godspeed, and we hope they get to their to their destination safely, and we hope nothing but the best for their family, and I'm sure y'all will be in touch with them, and I'm sure I'll probably be in touch with them, and, and we, hope their, I hope, we hope their work in Washington goes well, and we hope they have safe travels for the remainder of their journey. But as far as my family and I, we are glad to be here, glad to be members of the congregation here, and we appreciate you all, and we appreciate the opportunity that the elders have given, and that each one of you, each one of you have given, as as we have come here. It is good to be here. And I told someone else, and it's I'm going to keep repeating it. Right now, we're running around like chickens with our head cut off, and everything's not everything's still in boxes, but there are still plenty of boxes. But we're getting things sorted out. But it's good to have this Lord's Day with you. What we're going to be thinking about this morning and going to be turning to where the scripture reading was a moment ago, and I appreciate the songs and I appreciate the prayers, appreciate being able to remember the Lord's death and resurrection, and I appreciated the reading there in Matthew chapter 23. And what we're going to be thinking about today, we're going to be thinking about the subject of fathers. And if you follow the, the church's Facebook page, I had posted this yesterday. And Jesus spoke about fathers there in the scripture reading. There in Matthew 23 at verse 9, where he says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Like many passages in scripture, what we have to do is we have to look at the behavior that Jesus is trying to address. Because I, I know how this passage is often used, and it's not necessarily wrong. But what we have to do is we have to peel back the layers of the onion and we have to see, okay, what is Jesus really saying there? What is he really talking about? What is he really addressing? And what I would suggest is, obviously the problem is they're exalting themselves. You have the scribes and the Pharisees who are exalting themselves, who are loving the best places at feasts, verse 6, the best seats in the synagogue. They loved greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men a rabbi. But what I would suggest is, for example, there in verse 8, but you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Does this mean it's wrong to call anyone and anyone else in our lives teacher? You know, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, downstairs in class, uh, I think those young fellas, I assume they, they had a teacher. Is it, and I, Jesus is not saying it is wrong to call anyone else teacher. And in the same vein, he's not saying, for example, would it be wrong to call our dad's father? That's not what he's saying. And we'll give examples of that as we go along. What he's doing is he's dealing with the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees who love the preeminence. And they loved the recognition. And they exalted themselves. So you have to look at the behavior that Jesus is trying to address to understand really what he's, what he's speaking about. So the, the title of our lesson this morning is How Many Fathers? And sometimes, by the way, the titles of my lessons, sometimes they can get kind of odd. Sorry, just blame me for that. Um, but we're going to be thinking about how many fathers we have or had. And what I would suggest in our lives, we actually, at one point or another, will have five fathers. 
as odd as that sounds. And so just follow along as we go through this, and it'll, it'll be clear as we, we go along. But let's go ahead and get into the first point. Come to Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start by looking in verses 3 through 9. Hebrews 12, verses 3 through 9. Verse 3 says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Right? After we have the, the long list of the heroes of faith. And then chapter 12 begins by looking unto Jesus. Right? Being surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. Verse 1, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Verse 3, for consider him, that would be Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You know, it's a sad thing that the world, in today's day and age, they think that chastening, rebuke, they think that that is unloving. And it's actually just the opposite. They have it 180 degrees wrong that the Lord loves those that He chastens, and that He does not leave us to our own devices. If we are without chastening, then we are illegitimate and not sons. Now verse 9 though. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they, and let's read on, for they, that would be our human fathers, for they... Indeed, for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Whether we're talking about the Lord's chastening or whether we're talking about our earthly fathers, our human fathers chastening. I don't know what I don't know how your parents chastened you from with my dad, and I'm sure my dad's going to be watching this sermon when we post it on YouTube. And yes, I do talk about my family pretty often, sorry. But my my dad, I could hear the sound of his belt coming off when it was time to chasten me. Right? And you just knew what you were in for. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It's not joyful, but it's necessary. It's not joyful, but it's painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so we think about our earthly father. We have had human fathers who corrected us. Every single person who has ever walked on the face of this earth, except for three people, has had a human father. Every single one. The three who have not had human fathers are Adam, he did not have a human father. Eve, she did not have a human father. And Jesus, he did not have a human father. But even with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, you remember when he was a young, when he was a boy, when he was 12 years old? And actually, Joseph is referred to as his father, but we understand it was a virgin birth. But in that context, you remember when Mary finds him in the temple and he's answering and asking questions? And then he went back and it says, and he was subject to them. Plural. So even though Joseph may have not been his literal earthly father, Jesus still subjected himself as a, as a boy, I suppose you would say, 12-year-old at that point. He subjected himself to them. The King James here actually, there in verse 9 where it uses the word respect, I believe that's where the King James uses the word reverence, that we show them reverence. And that idea, some people, they just think that we should not revere anyone anymore. That we should not res really respect anyone anymore. And yet this verse pretty clearly shows, and I suppose it's a, the sign of the times that we're living in. And I'll ask the question, if you did not show your parents respect when you were young, what happened to you? <laughs> I know what happened to me when I did not show my parents respect. And it wasn't, and I think that's what gets into this, the chastening. 
and we are called to respect here in thinking about our fathers, but our parents in general. We know, what, we know what is said elsewhere. In Ephesians, in chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Training and admonition. I forgot to mention something earlier, by the way. Happy Father's Day. I was not planning on being here for my first sermon on Father's Day, but so be it. <laughs> here, here we are. And so happy Father's Day. And that's, of course, why we're speaking about this. How many fathers do we have? And where it all starts is with our human fathers, with those who brought us up. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Our human father, our earthly father, is the very first authority figure we ever know in our lives. The very first. Before, right, this is the first commandment with promise. Why is it the first commandment with promise? Because before we ever learn about our heavenly father, who do we learn about? Our human father our earthly father. The very first words out of your children's mouth. Just out of curiosity, anyone in here who's, who's had kids or grandkids, was the very first word out of their mouths God? Usually it's not God. It's not Jehovah. Usually it's either Mama or Daddy. It's usually one of those two. Before we ever come to know our Heavenly Father, we have the first commandment with promise, and we talk about our earthly Father. So, we, res we respect them. So again, it's not wrong to remember fathers on Father's Day. Mothers on Mother's Day. And I hope we don't just reserve honoring our mother and father for just one day out of the year. We should do that all the time. We, we recognize them. We value them. We care for them as they age. We turn to them. You know, it's one of the funniest things. Growing up, probably like a lot of young men growing up, I thought, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like my dad. And as the years have progressed, you know what I found? <laughs> the apple usually, not always, but usually doesn't fall too far from the tree. And that's okay. Because as I've gotten older, I appreciate my dad more. As a young man, as a teenager, you think, ah. But as we get older, and we appreciate them more and more. So we start with our earthly father. Somewhere along the line, though, as we grow, somewhere along the line, something, grows, something goes wrong. And that brings us to John chapter 8. Come to John chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse 37. John 8 at verse 37. The Lord is dealing with the Jews. John 8 at verse 37. And he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Now he's speaking about in the flesh. He says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the seeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. At some point, everyone who is of the age of accountability sins. And at some point, as, as they persist, and as when we were in that situation, 
when we persisted in our sin, and when we, when we chose unrighteousness, right? We were of the age of accountability, and we chose sin. And the longer that continued on, and what it brings us to is the, the second one, there is a devilish father. And if we are not doing the deeds of God, like the Jews were not, right? Here the Jews were, and they're like, oh, we have Abraham as our father. And Jesus says, no, if you're, if you're of Abraham, which he recognized they were of Abraham in the flesh, but Abraham is not the father according to the flesh, it's, he's the father of the faithful. And they were not being faithful. They were not doing what God wanted them to do. And because they were not doing what God wanted them to do, he says they were actually, their father was the devil. And when we do not do what God wants us to do, then either for a brief time or for longer than a brief time, we could say that the devil was our father. That is that is a harsh thing to say, but to look at this context, to look at this context and what's happening, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's, it's true. In 1 John chapter 3, at verse 8, it says, He who sins is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the, beginning, from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. There about in the middle of that paragraph, I would ask you, before you were born again, and you were in your sin, right? Before I was born again, and I was in my sin, could I rightly say that I was a child of God? Before I was born again, I couldn't say it. I couldn't say it because I was in sin and I was continuing to sin. And that's the harsh reality. When we, when we rebel against God, even now if we rebel against God, if we rebel against Jesus, we know what Hebrews says. Hebrews speaks about those who sin willfully. Do you remember what it says in Hebrews when it says, those who sin willfully, what they are actually doing to Jesus? It says that they are crucifying Him afresh. And that's what we do when we sin willfully. We crucify Him afresh. And we have this verse in John chapter 8 where Jesus says that they were trying to kill Him. Verse 40, but now you seek to kill me. When we sin willfully, we are crucifying Him, trying to crucify Him afresh. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful. So that's the second father. Now hopefully He's no longer our father. And we'll, we'll get to that here in just a moment. But we have a human father. We have the devilish father. We also have, come to 1 Corinthians 4 now. And this one's, this one's interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I think this is where we may run into issues if we don't understand it with the Scripture reading. When Jesus says, call no man father. Because I know how that passage is often used. It's often used if we have friends who are Catholic. Right? And they have, of course, they have the clergy and how they refer to their clergy. But again, what Jesus is dealing with is those who desire the preeminence and those who wanted to be called such things as father. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, we know the issues going on at Corinth. And Paul says, verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son, in the Lord who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere and in every church. How was Timothy his son? It wasn't in the flesh. It was in faith. And how were the Corinthians? How could he say about the Corinthians, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. You may have 10,000 instructors, but you do not have many fathers. 
every Christian in all likelihood has had someone who first taught them the gospel. Right? The very first one, he says, you might have 10,000 teachers. If I asked you in your life, how many teachers have you had? And I want to <laughs> ask, I know, Bruce, y'all were married in this church building, weren't you? Isn't that right? How many teachers have you had down through the years? I won't ask you to count them right now. A lot. We've all had a lot of teachers in our lives. Right? Some visiting, some not visiting. A lot of teachers. Now, who is the first person to ever teach you the gospel? Who is the first one? Now, you may have just picked up a Bible and read it and just done it that way. But you may have been like the, like the fella, right? The, the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? Do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone guides me? And Philip went up into the chariot. Do you think the eunuch ever forgot about Philip, that man who came up into the chariot? Do you think he ever forgot about him? They would go their separate ways, but he probably never forgot. Do you think those folks in Acts chapter 2, as the Lord added to the church daily, and the Lord was adding to the church daily, those who were being saved, but do you think they ever forgot Peter? Do you think they ever forgot James and John? Even after James was beheaded, even after, after the dispersion, after the stoning of Stephen, do you think as the gospel spread, and as Paul, as Paul in his travels would go and he would, he would teach as he's speaking about here, the first time someone heard the gospel, and it may be, that your earthly parents are also your spiritual parents in that sense. They may have been the first ones to teach you the gospel. Your father or your mother may have been the first ones to teach you the gospel. And I would suggest that's an added blessing. But here as Paul speaks about it, as he speaks about, you may have 10,000 instructors, but you do not have many fathers. In Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Is Paul looking for the preeminence? Is Paul looking for a title? Is Paul looking for, for anything along those lines? No, he's not looking for that. He's just recognizing the reality of the situation. That he was the first one to teach them the gospel. And just like any father, he says, I urge you, imitate me. Do you remember when Philip says to Jesus, show us the father? And Jesus says, how long have I been with you? What Jesus is effectively saying is, I'm just like him. I'm just like him. And that is how very often it is. And so he says, therefore I urge you, imitate me. And my point is real simple. Should we appreciate not only our teachers, but should we not also appreciate the very first person who ever teaches us the gospel? The very first one who took the time and put in the work to bring the gospel to us. It's a teaching, our teaching father, as it is, as Paul speaks of it here. As we responded to that teaching, as we did that, what promise do we partake of? And now we get closer to where we are in class. Come to Romans chapter 4 now. In Romans chapter 4, as we hear the gospel, and as we respond to the gospel, in Romans chapter 4, at verse 13, it says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, are heirs faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father 
of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. If we come, if we come when the Lord calls us, then we can rightly say that we also have a father in Abraham. Right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And it's not according to the flesh. It's according to faith. And so this is now father number four. Right? As we think about a human father, and we think about the devilish father for a time, and then we think about a teaching father, and now we have the father of the faithful. The Jews often referred to Abraham as Father Abraham. They're actually rebuked for that a couple of times. One of them is in Luke 3 at verse 8 when John the Baptist says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Right? Because there they were and they thought just because they were Jews in the flesh, they thought, oh, that means we have Father Abraham. Like, no, he's the father of the faithful. And so they were rebuked. They were sort of the, the original entitlement generation. They thought they were entitled to it just because of who they're, because of their genealogy in the flesh. Jesus also rebukes them for this same thing in John 8, verse 39 and 40. They answered and said to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, right? This is the verse we read earlier. If you're Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth. Abraham did not do this. No, Abraham is the father of the faithful, whether it be Jew or Gentile. He's the father of the faithful. And so when we look at our list, again, we have an earthly father. For a time we had a devilish father. Someone taught us, likely, so we had a teaching father. And then if we responded to the gospel, if we came when the Lord called, then we are like Abraham. And of course, that brings us to our Heavenly Father. Right? That brings us to our Heavenly Father. Come to Romans chapter 8 now. Come over just a page or two to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, Romans 8 verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. How are we God's child? By natural birth? No. But by adoption. And I cannot think of a better picture of God's mercy and grace than adoption. You know, when my children were born, <laughs> and they came out, and you know, they had no choice about who their father was. And they came out, and I didn't have much choice about what they were going to be like. And I got two kids over here, and they're like oil and water sometimes. <laughs> Different personalities. But that's a natural, that's a natural birth. But with adoption, what is it like? That we are children of a children through adoption. The spirit of adoption. And that we have God's chosen people. And you have a choice. And so we cry out, Abba, Father. Just picture that. Someone coming, someone coming to an orphanage, perhaps. Right? Or someone coming to a facility like that. And you have all of these children who are just wanting to be adopted. Would you cry out, Abba Father? Right? The spirit of adoption. The idea of choice. And it's just a wonderful picture. Because what we have in that passage, we have Jesus. And what is Jesus? 
the only begotten. He's the begotten. But we have Jesus, the only begotten of the Father. And now, what are we to Jesus? I will declare your name to my brethren. That we are brothers and sisters of Jesus. We are fellow heirs of the only begotten. You have the only begotten and you have us. And what are we? We are children by adoption. And so we cry out, Abba, Father. And it's just a wonderful picture of God's grace. Come over to 2 Corinthians now as we wrap things up. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as we think about fathers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's start reading in verse 16. Hebrew, or pardon me, 2 Corinthians 6 at verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God? We're going to use this passage and one earlier for an invitation this morning. In 2 Corinthians 6 at verse, verse 15. What accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That is the promise we have if we will come to the Lord. And we know what is said. I actually read on in chapter 7 and verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Because the promises have been made. The earlier verse in chapter 6, chapter 6 and then the lesson is yours. Verse 2, now yeah, verse 1. We then as workers together with Him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so the invitation is to come out. If you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, come out. Come out. Come out from among them and be separate, it says. Do not touch what is unclean. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In Acts chapter 2, they said, it, they, the apostles, pardon me, said, save yourselves from this perverse generation. And as many as believed, as heard and believed the word, what did they do? They turned from their sins, confessed that Jesus was indeed Lord in Christ. Right? This Jesus whom you crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. They confessed that and they were baptized. They were baptized for the remission of their sins. They were baptized into Jesus. They were baptized into the body and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So what we say is, today is Father's Day. And make it a good Father's Day. But I'm not talking about our human father. There's nothing wrong with honoring our human father. I'm talking about our heavenly father. And so we say what the passage says. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What better Father's Day could there be than that? Than to respond to our heavenly father and to come when He calls, just like Abraham did. Just like Abraham did. We've all had human fathers. But there's only one heavenly Father. And so we respond to Him. If you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. If you've left the faith, return to the faith. If you need the prayers of the saints, come to the throne of grace. Because we know what the Lord does. You will find help in time of need. That is what the Lord, that is what the Lord does. So if you're here and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing today.